Welcome everyone to tonight's uh, webinar. We will be starting in just a moment here. Hi, good evening and welcome. In this era of volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity, now more than ever, we need to elevate our knowledge on the principles that guide us to make a positive impact in our community. I'm Dr. Marvin Campos, the Area Medical Director for Kaiser Permanente in Kern County, and welcome. KP is a proud sponsor of the Kegley Institute of Ethics since 2010. And I'm grateful for our continued strong partnership throughout the years. At KP, we strive to bring forward forums and topics that address the importance of ethical living and decision making as part of a healthy community. Tonight's discussion will focus on the inequities facing persons with disabilities and the lessons COVID has taught us about righting these injustices. We hope that this sheds light on the differences that we can make as individuals in our healthcare systems to improve the healthcare outcomes for these disabled persons. I know you will find it enlightening and intellectually stimulating. Thank you for being here. And for that, I turn it over back to Dr. Nate Nolson. Nate. Thank you so much for that welcome, Dr. Campos. Um, we at the Kegley Institute of Ethics are very glad to be partnering again with Kaiser Permanente on tonight's event, which is the third event in our Bioethics and Medical Humanities speaker series. Um, my name is uh, Nate Olson. I'm the Associate Director of the Kegley Institute of Ethics. Um, before I introduce tonight's speaker, a few words on the format of tonight's event. So after Dr. Reynolds' talk, uh, a couple of guests will come on to ask him questions. And after that, after a couple of guests ask questions, we're gonna open it up to questions from you, the audience. So um, you can see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. Uh, at any point during tonight's event, during Dr. Reynolds' talk or after Dr. Reynolds' talk, you can submit questions for him in the Q&A using that Q&A button. Um, during that end portion, the Q&A part, we will, I'll pose some of those questions to him. Um, also, uh, toward the end of tonight's event, we will place a link to an evaluation in the chat. Uh, please let us know your thoughts on the event or other topics you would like to see us discuss in the future. Uh, for those of you seeking continuing medical education credit, this is also how you can, uh, completing that evaluation is how you can receive credit for doing so. Uh, there's no clinical content in tonight's event and the participants have not received any commercial support. Uh, the event has been approved for one hour of continuing medical education credit and one hour of continuing education units. Okay, so um, now I'm pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Dr. Joel Michael Reynolds is Assistant Professor of Philosophy and Disability Studies at Georgetown University, uh, which happens to be where I did my PhD. He's also a Senior Research Scholar in the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown, 
and a senior advisor to the Hastings Center, a top bioethics research institute. Dr. Reynolds is a leading scholar in disability studies. He's the founder and co-editor of the Journal of Philosophy of Disability and the author or editor of six books on topics in disability studies, including The Life Worth Living, Disability, Pain, and Morality, which will be coming out in March 2022. Dr. Reynolds, we're very happy to have you with us this evening. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, if you cannot hear me or there are any issues, please, please interrupt me. I'll begin with a few brief thank yous. First of all, so many thanks for the invitation from um, Dr. Michael Burroughs from the Kegley Institute at CSU Bakersfield and support from Kaiser Permanente. Thanks to Dr. Olson for all of his logistical support as well. Um, I'm gonna now share my screen uh, because I need you to see another uh, person, another being, I should say, who deserves a lot of thanks. And that would be my dog, Schnurp, uh, who is secretly the person who, you know, does most of my work for me. He's, he's very effective. This paper, he clearly didn't like. He, he was brutal in the editing of this one. Uh, on a more serious note, um, I do think uh, my, my, I'm not, Schnurp is not my pet, I am his human. I do think Schnurp, but I also want to give a big shout out to uh, my family, uh, all of the work that I do, and uh, especially all of the work that I do that I hope has some sort of clinical impact and that helps practitioners do their jobs better, really arises out of my experiences with my family and the experiences we had um, being saved by, but also running into certain issues um, in, in healthcare. I also want to quickly give a shout out to the work, the, the pioneering work of first and second generation disability bioethicists and philosophers of disability, people like Teresa Blankmeyer Burke, Susan Wendell, Adrian Ash, Anita Silvers, Kim Q. Hall, Rosemary Garland Thompson, Eva Kate, Jackie Leach Scully, Alicia Ouellette, Joseph Stramondo, and Gregor Wolbring, among many others and the many, many disability activists and disability studies scholars who over the last many, many decades uh, have created bodies of work that people like I get to draw upon uh, and learn from. In terms of accessibility housekeeping, uh, again, to repeat, please interrupt me if there is some sort of problem or something is, is going awry. I do want to give a quick content warning. There will be some talk of things like eugenics, infanticide, issues surrounding disability stigma. So, um, you know, if you need to pull yourself away from the talk, uh, please be prepared to do that. So let's jump in. I'd like to begin with two quick quotes. First is from Susan Wendell, who I mentioned uh, a bit ago. She writes in her 1996 book, The Rejected Body, not only the architecture, but the entire physical and social organization of life assumes that we are either strong and healthy and able to do what the average able-bodied person can do, or that we're completely disabled, unable to participate in life. And the second quote from um, uh, psychological ecologist J.J. Gibson, who writes, the meaning of a value, excuse me, the meaning or value of a thing consists of what it affords. As a bright-eyed eight-year-old in rainy Oregon, few things seemed cooler to me than Hollywood, California, the land of picture-perfect beaches, fast cars, and blockbuster movies. That summer, my film industry uncle rode his Harley up I-5 through the towering redwoods and into the land of Douglas firs to visit my family. Despite tales of A-list stars and the Sunset Boulevard life, the conversation around our dinner table that hot July night turned to the mundane. My uncle did not wear a helmet when he rode his motorcycle. In fact, he refused to. This alarmed my parents, eager to instill in me the idea that helmet wearing was mandatory, no, whether I was riding a bicycle or, or you name it. But in response to prodding, my uncle did not mince his words. I'd rather be dead than disabled. Silence filled the room. That fateful phrase hung on the air for what seemed like an eternity as Jason, my brother and my best friend, sat next to him in his shiny new wheelchair, being fed by my father, Alan. My maternal grandparents, in the transitional thickets 
of age and illness-related disabilities, they sat on his other side. And my mother, Gail, recently diagnosed with temporomandibular joint disorder, TMJ, fibromyalgia, and other conditions that would quickly lead her to become disabled, she sat across the table as well. I wasn't angry then, but I am now. Not at my uncle, but at that idea. I'd rather be dead than disabled. I soon came to know that many, far too many across the globe, hold that idea without compunction. I learned that the road to death for countless people with disabilities across history have been paved by that idea and by ones like it. Even those who might say it and immediately regret it, as did my uncle, they invoke an assumption about the worth of a life lived with disabilities that's as old as history itself. For example, on his deathbed, Socrates asks, is life worth living with a body that's in a bad and corrupted condition? In no way, replies his friend Crito. The question of a worthy life, of the good life, has always been a question about disability. As my eyes pan slowly across the dinner table to gauge others' reactions, my mind's eye focused on a very simple fact. The sheer existence of so many others seemed to prove my uncle wrong. My life, the life of my brother, my grandparents, my mother, and the life of every other disabled person I knew and today know suggest the opposite. These lives suggest instead that being disabled is like any other significant facet of human identity. It shapes one's world, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in bad, but always in context and situationally dependent ways. What would it mean to take that insight seriously? Across the globe right now, racism, sexism, cisgenderism, ableism, ethno-nationalism, and classism are being leveraged to spectacular effect. With little to lose and much to gain, fascists and demagogues wield power through bets underwritten by national and international corporations, bets by millionaires and billionaires whose God is green and who demands just one thing, unfettered growth. Progress appears veneer, equality, tenuous, justice, trodden, and even the mildest cosmopolitanism, a ruse. We can't even get everyone to wear a mask, for goodness sake. To ask then on this day, in these days, specifically about disability and disability justice, might ring rash, untimely, or strangely narrow. The future of scientific inquiry, of democratic societies, of entire populations, of the Earth's ecosystems, and of global peace are all at stake. The fate of much of humanity and numerous other beings hangs in the balance, if not the gallows. I hope today to demonstrate why it is precisely with such stakes in mind that disability justice must be addressed. Indeed, I hope to suggest today that a disability justice framework is one of the most promising frameworks to address the problems facing the world today, not just in healthcare, but in public health, global health, and beyond. I want to begin with three vignettes. One is about a woman with intellectual disabilities in an ICU during the COVID-19 pandemic last year in Pendleton, Oregon. The second is about the treatment and prognosis of children with trisomy 13 and 18. And the third vignette will be about famous psychologist Steven Pinker. Vignette number one. Though it may not seem so at first, I, should, I forgot to add this qualifier. I think these three stories taken together provide a groundwork and provide profound insights concerning disability justice and how we might bring it about. Perhaps I should have called these case studies instead of vignettes. Number one, in December 2020, NPR, National Public Radio, um, put out a piece by investigative reporter Joseph Shapiro that detailed the story of a woman with intellectual disabilities who sought medical care at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in the small rural town of Pendleton, Oregon. I actually have extended family members who live there. She needed a ventilator, but her physician denied it citing her low quality of life. He asked her to sign a form that would allow the hospital to deny her further care. After threats of lawsuits, this woman was transferred to another hospital where proper care was given to her and she recovered and she's doing just fine today. 
Oregon State Senator Sarah Gelzer told NPR, quote, nothing happened to that hospital. Nothing happened to that physician. The health authority confirmed that, in fact, that was a coerced do not intubate order. They confirmed it happened, but there was no sanction. And Joseph Shapiro, the reporter for the rights, the state records that NPR obtained show other people with disabilities were denied coronavirus tests or treatment when they showed up at hospitals with symptoms. And for those who've been paying attention, such blatant cases of discrimination on the basis of disability, which uh, of course are illegal relative to the ADA and other laws, um, they've been widespread during the COVID-19 pandemic and not only in the United States, but across the globe. Vignette number two. In 2016, John Lantos, a practicing pediatrician and a bioethicist, he published an editorial in the Journal of the American Medical Association that was entitled Trisomy 13 and 18, Treatment Decisions in a Stable Gray Zone. And I wanna read a long quote from the beginning of that piece. He writes, 30 years ago, pediatric residents were taught that trisomy 13 and 18 were lethal congenital anomalies. Parents were told that these conditions were incompatible with life. Accordingly, there was a tacit consensus that life-sustaining treatment was not medically indicated, and clinical experience was usually consistent with this self-fulfilling prophecy. Occasionally, though, some infants with these conditions did survive. The children, uh, and I should have said trisomy 13 and 18 are also called Edwards and Patau syndromes, respectively, the children were invariably institutionalized and they were described as severely impaired. These case re reports were considered as the rare exceptions that proved the rule. In the age of social media, however, and I'm, I'm still reading from Lantos's piece, everything changed. Parents share stories and videos on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you name it, showing their happy four and five-year-old children with these conditions. Survival, it turns out, is not as rare as one's thought. And these children, namely the ones who were not institutionalized, looked happy, they looked cared for and loved. And it became increasingly awkward to describe these conditions as incompatible with life to parents who had ready access to information, showing that to seemingly not be true. Still, old myths die hard. Many physicians still today tell parents that death is inevitable. Former United States Senator Rick Santorum has actually spoken in public about the counseling that he and his wife received about their daughter, Bella, also uh, uh, Isabella is also how she's called, who has trisomy 13. After the infant spent 10 days in the NICU, in the, the neonatal intensive care unit, Bella's condition was stable with supplemental oxygen. The parents and the physicians agreed that Bella would go home and receive hospice care. The parents, however, wanted to continue providing oxygen. The physicians wanted to discontinue it. One physician bluntly told the Santorums, you realize that your child is going to die. You have to learn to let go. They got the oxygen. Bella survived. A few months later, she had a viral upper respiratory tract infection, led to respiratory arrest. Her parents provided cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Again, she survived. She's now eight years old, off oxygen, and apparently medically stable. That was written in 2016. I checked. She's still alive today, a happy 13-year-old going on 14. Vignette number three. In 2015, psychologist turned bioethicist turned popular science writer, I guess, Steven Pinker penned an op-ed in the Boston Globe entitled The Moral Imperative for Bioethics. And in it, he says this. Some say that it's simple prudence to pause and consider the long-term implications of biomedical research before it rushes headlong into changing the human condition. But this is an illusion. First, slowing down research has a massive human cost. Even a one-year delay in implementing an effective treatment could spell death, suffering, or disability for millions of people. Second, technological prediction, he continues, beyond a horizon of a few years is so futile that any policy based on it is almost certain to do more harm than good. I'm going to bracket that his formulation is just patently um, question begging and wouldn't get past a logic 101 class. I'm going to focus on the more <laughs> narrow line um, that death, suffering and disability 
are so similar for Pinker that they can be grouped together, he thinks, as experiences no one wants and obviously so. Imagine making sense of your experience if you're labeled and understand yourself as disabled under such circumstances. For someone like Pinker, the credibility of a person living with disability who disagrees with the aspiration of eliminating disability or curing all disabilities, that person would have a total and not just a deflated level of testimonial credibility. And Pinker's claim, and this is important I think to note, is in step with uh, a whole host of people who call themselves transhumanists or posthumanists, nearly all of whom actively seek the total eradication of disability from the human species, and in doing so conflate a whole range a rich, wide and complex range of corporeal and psychological variabilities that we categorize with that umbrella term disability, conflating them with pain and with suffering and with disease and illness. There are two unifying threads, I think, between these three vignettes or these three cases, if you will. First, there's a very fraught relationship between disability and assumptions concerning quality of life with disability. Second, there is a societal, a society-wide failure to provide equitable care and to be more specific, to provide equitable conditions in order to be able to provide care. I want to begin by focusing on the first issue, and that is what I will spend most of my remaining time on, um, and specifically as it relates to healthcare, before turning near the conclusion of the talk towards this second issue. But I think that getting clarity on the first is needed and important to get the stakes of and the path forward for the second in, in clearer sight. Section one, disability, quality of life, and healthcare. None of these three vignettes are remotely surprising to disabled people or to anyone in disability communities. For example, my parents were told that my brother Jason had a 95% chance he wouldn't live to be one. I've looked up the information available at the time that this would have been uttered, and there was no such information. They were told that if he lived, he would also have a terrible quality of life and probably die young. Well, he lived to be 24. And he led one of the happier lives I have personally witnessed during my time on Earth. His care was complicated. There were some rough times, but he had a he had a very good 24 years. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I am not arguing that things are awry regarding links between quality of life and disability just based upon this anecdote from my personal experience. I'm also not arguing it based upon the story of that woman in Pendleton or based upon Lantos's evidence regarding trisomy 20, uh, excuse me, regarding trisomy, trisomy 13 and 18. I'm arguing, as many have before me, that there is an overwhelmingly large body of evidence across disability studies and across work and in, in disability activism that biomedicine as a whole and society more generally historically has and still today gets quality of life wrong with respect to how it thinks about a vast range of disabilities. For example, in a recent, very recent, this just came out in February, uh, 2021 survey um, of 714 practicing physicians in the USA, this was published in Health Affairs by Iazoni and colleagues, only 40.7 expressed confidence in their ability to provide the same quality of care to patients with significant disability as to those without. This study, of course, adds fuel to this larger body of evidence, suggesting that many people with disabilities do, in fact, receive prejudicial uh, or otherwise inequitable forms of care, are exposed to higher rates of medical error, etc., compared to their non-disabled counterparts. And in the same 2021 study, I think both of these statistics are very um, uh, informative, in that same study, 82.4% of these physicians reported that people with significant disability have worse quality of life than non-disabled people. There's a small problem with that, and it's it's false. That's the problem. That judgment directly conflicts with a large body of social scientific research um, across a wide range of, of populations of, of people with disabilities, suggesting that people with significant disability, just as those with non-significant disability and just as those who are able-bodied, they experience similar 
not lower levels of quality of life. Now, these findings are especially worrisome with respect to at least the following three implications, right? One, there's a substantial discrepancy between how disabled people in fact experience their lives and how many, not all, how many physicians conceive of the relationship between quality of life and significant disability. Two, there may be some sort of link, there likely is, there may be some sort of link between that discrepancy and the quality as well as the equity of care for disabled patients. And three, this issue does not seem to have uh, improved in a statistically significant way for decades. There's studies like the Iazoni one, smaller studies uh, going back to the, the 90s that suggest this similar divergence between actual evidence regarding QOL for people with significant disability um, and physician judgments regarding it. All right, so there's the problem. How should we think about this? How should we, how should we get around uh, what we could just summarize as, let's call this the disability health disparity problem? Well, let's, let's back up a little bit and let's think about some of the, the ways in which this can impact care, right? So we know among other things that patient provider, excuse me, patient practitioner communication, as well as the role of implicit biases of various sorts, uh, those can in and of themselves affect health outcomes. We also know that in addition to issues with QOL uh, and people with disabilities, at a much broader level, there are some studies suggesting that physicians systematically underestimate patients' level of communicative satisfaction. That's patients across ability categories. Um, and those communication issues, there's some evidence suggesting that whatever's going on there might track issues uh, along uh, identity categories, racial differences, uh, question, uh, uh, sex, gender differences, etc. And we also know from some research, uh, like the Iazoni study, that this issue is especially problematic with respect to patients with disabilities. Well, what's the underlying, let's I'll put on, you know, uh, the diagnostic hat. What is there an underlying cause here? Is there a root to this problem? I think if you look at research in critical disability studies, philosophy of disability, and uh, the field of what's sometimes called disability bioethics as a whole, a lot of this work would suggest that ableism is, if it's not the root cause, it's at least a core, perhaps primary contributing cause to these sorts of issues. Why? Well, on this sort of way of looking at things, it's via implicit and explicit forms of bias that then bleed into practices of communication, that bleed into actual concrete practices inside of the clinic, whether it's treatment protocol, protocols, whether it's differential diagnoses and prognoses, et cetera, that ableism leads practitioners, again, likely unwittingly, to undervalue, to misinterpret, and to prejudge the lives, the quality of life, the, the, the character of life, and the testimony of disabled people. And of course, this is uh, this is not just a like, oh, we let, this is all physicians' fault, right? This this is uh, something that exists in the larger society. Uh, this is something that I think is rooted not simply in certain aspects of medical education, but education as a whole. And I both mean formal education and informal uh, education coming from religious communities, coming from broader social cultural contexts. And this negatively impacts the ability of physicians to provide the sort of equitable care that they would want, among other reasons, because it forecloses opportunities for practitioners uh, to be able to provide more capacious and health promoting framings of dis disability experiences and do so in a way that then will uh, impact actual concrete uh, care. Now you might say to me, okay, this is an interesting hypothesis, um, but what in the world is ableism? <laughs> Which is uh, uh, a very fair question to have. This term, uh, thankfully, I think is popping up more and more and more in just average everyday discussions, whether it's on TikTok or the New York Times. And as with any good uh, uh, useful uh, concept, no one actually agrees on its definitive meaning. But let me give you the kind of disability studies 101. You learn this on the first day of class, sort of very simple definition. And it goes something like this. Ableism is the assumption, the default assumption, that the standard or normal able body is in and of itself better. It's just better. It's preferable than non-standard or abnormal forms of embodiment, usually forms we call disability. 
are called disabled. Ableism is that assumption and the discrimination and the oppression and the stigmatizations that result from that assumption. Now you might read this and think, wow, that seems like, so you've got, you know, the assumption aspect that feels like it's just a question of people's beliefs or judgments. It's very cognitive. And then you're referring to its impacts in the world. Is, is ableism just something that lives on in assumptions? And of course, disability studies scholars will be very quick to say, no, this is not just about what individual people think. Ableism can be seen everywhere once you know how to look for it, in how buildings are built, in how institutions are structured, in norms regarding labor stuff, in you, you name it. And so ableism always should be thought of as having structural components in addition to individual or cognitive ones. And so you can think about this in terms of structural ableism, right? So the systems, the practices, the institutions, the habits that assume able-bodiedness as, as, as default, as a fundamental good that can result in either purposefully or incidentally, that can result in the exclusion stigmatization, discrimination, oppression against disabled people. That's the simple, very, very, uh, um, not very nuanced explanation of ableism. Um, the point of this, and I will give you in just a second a more nuanced version of it, the point is that whether or not any given individual and whether or not you, whoever you might be, holds ableist views, able-bodied people benefit from structural ableism. I'm ambulatory, I can use stairs to walk. I benefit from a world that usually has stairs as a way to get up an incline from point A to point B, and that excludes people who that's not their modality of, of getting from point A to point B over an incline. And the other point that I, I hope comes through at this is that combating those structures, those habits, and the way they're built into institutions and practices and everything, um, that takes ongoing effort, not just by people fighting explicitly for disability justice, but by everyone. We all have to get on board with undermining uh, ableism in the same way or in, in analogous, broadly analogous ways that we all have to get on board uh, and be anti-racist and anti-sexist and all these things. Otherwise, it's not going to cut it to bring about a more just and equitable world. I won't spend too much time on this because this could be like, well, this could be a class all on this, this slide, but I do want to give a shout out to, to Leela A. Lewis. Lewis is a disability uh, scholar and, and uh, activist, and Lewis has this working definition of ableism up on Lewis's website that I find to be, this is probably the most nuanced and in some ways, I think, certainly historically accurate understanding of ableism I've run across. Um, and I'll just read it out loud and kind of leave it as something for you to think about. Uh, one of the things I like about this is that the definition ties in how structures of ableism actually relate to a longer history, especially in a U.S. context, one that involves everything from the transatlantic slave trade to histories of colonization and genocide against indigenous peoples, etc. And the way that Lewis defines this is as a system, ableism is a system, note right there, we're not sticking uh, we're not thinking merely about individuals, uh, individual beliefs or judgments. It's a system that places value on people's bodies and minds based on socially constructed ideas of normality, intelligence, excellence, desirability, and productivity. These constructed ideals are deeply rooted, uh, and es especially in the U.S. context, there would need to be probably some, some modifications here if we're talking about, I don't know, Brazil or talking about India, etc., some at least. Um, deeply rooted in anti-blackness, in eugenics, in misogyny, colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism. Lewis continues, uh, this form of systemic oppression leads to people and society determining who is valuable and worthy based on a person's language, appearance, religion, and or their ability to satisfactorily produce and reproduce, excel and behave. And Lewis ends by saying, you don't have to be disabled either labeled by others as disabled or identify as disabled to experience ableism at this systems level. And if this seems um, abstract or too complicated, uh, I could tell you lots of stories of being in the ICU with my brother Jason and hearing like three feet from my parents and I uh, having a, an RN be like, I don't know why they're caring for him. Like, and the implication being his life doesn't have any value. 
he couldn't go to school because of the particular way his body and mind work. He wasn't part of the labor force. They didn't understand why we would care for someone who wasn't, whose body and mind wasn't valuable and worthy relative to whatever assumptions were in this particular person's mind. And the fact that Jason was, you know, that we, that Jason was white, my family's white, that this would have played out, of course, very differentially if, uh, if we didn't have the privileges of whiteness. This would have played out very differently if we were poorer than we already were. This would have played out differently if we didn't have health insurance, um, which we did thanks to my dad's construction job. You know, there's a whole intersectional story to be told there of how ableism will play out differentially relative to valuations that involve all of these uh, different uh, identity categories and ways that we socially carve up people and assign value or difference to them. I'm running out of time to give you the little um, uh, mini history of philosophy uh, um, jot, uh, jaunt, jaunt, I think that's a word. Uh, the point is, I just want to do, um, the point of this section of the paper was just to say, this is a really old idea. And ableism, even though it does have, I think, a unique form from, say, the 16th and 17th centuries forward in quote unquote modernity, I think we can find evidence of something like this system at play in ancient Greece, Rome, in you know, you, you name it. And I gave some examples here. I also gave some examples to say this, the very negative, the blatantly eugenic views towards disability that we see during the eugenic movement in the US at the turn of the 20th century. Um, these ideas really haven't actually gone anywhere. They're just popping up in different spots. Like, for example, one of the most famous living bioethicists writing in 1980, and he still defends this view to this day, that killing a disabled infant is not morally equivalent to killing a person. So what is the way around ableism? How do, how do we approach this as a problem? And how, how does one approach it not simply as one uh, goes about one's daily life, but how does one think about this at the level of uh, in the clinic and at the level of actually communicating with real disabled patients? Well, one of the most important things, and here I'm just saying, you know, really the mantra from disability studies, disability is everywhere once you know to look for it, but you have to learn to look for it and you have to do the work to learn about it. For example, um, I was taught to believe that if, you, if I lost my hearing, it would automatically be a bad thing, or that if someone was born deaf, that's obviously a bad thing. You can't hear. You learn about deaf communities, capital D, and there are some people who, are, who have audiological loss, quote unquote, who, in, who love being deaf, and they view it as being a part of a community, a signing community, whether they use American Sign Language, British Sign Language, whatever it might be, and signing communities have rich histories. There's deaf rap. There's deaf, you know. There's all sorts of stuff that is built around this way of interacting. In the same way that there's rich histories and culture and all sorts of things built around distinct languages, whether it's French or whether it's Mandarin or you name it. Think about um, the way we are often taught with a kind of default ableist assumption that oh well, if you are impaired in the sense of not having legs, obviously that's a bad. Then you learn more about prosthetics, especially some of the more recent stuff, and you find that people like Oscar Pistorius were barred from being part of the regular Olympics because he was seen as having an advantage, <laughs> an advantage over those with biological limbs. These cheetah blades um, uh, cost, they had a lower metabolic cost and all of this stuff. And the more you start thinking critically about the relationship between embodiment and technology, um, whether prostheses or more general things, you start to see that this idea that in his case, oh, he lost his legs and that's automatically a bad. Um, it might be a bad at the time, especially if it's non-congenital. There might be, well, certainly given social scientific research, there's going to be a, a, a hard transition stage, but that doesn't necessarily mean his life is going to uh, be terrible. And the meaningfulness of that particular disability is actually extremely complex. I see I've already hit the 30 minute mark, so I will try and finish in two more minutes. See, when I'm not, uh, not, there's no real live audience here, and so my timing has been off with the slides, so I apologize. Um, I was gonna make a similar point about blindness. If you learn more, if you actually talk with people who are blind, you learn that their relationship with, uh, especially seeing eye dogs is such that they feel as though often they will talk about seeing in the world and going through the world. 
uh, not with blindness not being a loss, not the lack of sight, but as something they gain and as a, a unique way of uh, engaging with the world. Um, and then also there's a whole a whole rich literature about thinking about um, there's a riff, a rich literature engaging questions of intellectual and cognitive differences uh, that tries to think about not all of them, but many of them in terms of diversity. This is especially true of how people uh, of discussions around things like autism, uh, but also ADHD, uh, etc. And you find that some people uh, take great pride in the way in which they are neurodiverse and the idea that it's a, lock or a loss or a lack or something that should be cured um, is not the default correct approach in uh, uh, at least all cases. Oh yes, I had two um, satirical uh, pieces I found online about ableism that I will have to skip through. So what's the point? All right, I have one minute left. Disability activists and disability studies scholars have developed a very simple, very powerful distinction to try and give an initial grip to undo ableist assumptions and to undo uh, um, problematic ways of thinking about disability. And this is to distinguish between the medical and social model of disability. In short, the medical model is what almost everyone that I know is taught as a kid, and it's the default model in, in most medical spaces, though not all. Rehabilitation medicine in particular has gotten way more nuanced in the way that they think about these things over the last few decades. But on a medical model, right, disability just is, is something that went wrong for an individual. It's a defect, it's a deformity, it's, it's a lack, it's uh, uh, something like this. And on social models, um, and this goes back to the very earliest disability activism in the US and UK, they're like, no, 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 there are impairments. There are atypicalities and abnormalities of bodies. Some of those bring about some complications, but what disables a person is living in a society where they are stigmatized, where they are discriminated against, living in a society where it is legal to build things in such a way that only some people can get in the building, that only some people can use the pathway, that only some people can communicate over the internet because you know the person doesn't use closed caption or the platform doesn't use closed captioning or they're not using alt text or something like this. Disability comes about from a society that has ableist practices built into it. And if we could get rid of those ableist practices, guess what? We'd have a much juster world. We don't need to necessarily, or at least in all cases, focus on fixing and curing impairments. And I was going to show you this picture, which this is like what I always use kind of first day of class of, on, on, uh, of this person in a wheelchair in front of some stairs on a medical model. What's going on here? Something's wrong with this individual. Maybe they have a, a steel fusion that's healing between C4 and C7. Maybe they have fibromyalgia and it's a day they have a lot of lethargy. But you would explain what's going on here as a problem with the individual. On a social model, you can immediately see that whatever impairments the person has, the problem is that a person, probably lots of people, decided to make stairs here instead of ramps, instead of some other configuration that would allow people using any number of mobility devices, um, also just people carrying lots of bags, people having a kid in a stroller, et cetera, et cetera, um, they chose to not go that route. That was a choice made by other people that then excludes this person. And, wow, I really did not time this well. All right, so let's get to the very end. There is, I just gave what I think is a kind of disability studies 101 entry point to thinking about how to undermine and undo ableism. Well, what is the next step? How do we stop things like the situation in Pendleton, Oregon from occurring? How do we stop people like um, uh, the, the particular physician that Lantos named mistakenly talking to parents as if trisomy 13 and 18 are automatically not compatible with life? And how do we stop people like Pinker from making very, very ignorant uh, uh, comments? Well, one thing I think that where all of this leads and what COVID-19 has taught us, what disability studies scholars and disability activists have taught us for years, is that we need disability justice to be at the core of our society, not on the periphery. What does that mean? I'm going to skip that slide. I'll come back to it in the Q&A. First of all, anti-discrimination approaches like the ADA are just insufficient. 
we need a constitutional approach to disability rights. We must, in other words, support and support at the level of the Constitution a real social net that and by real I mean giving universal access to basic goods housing water nutritious food ele electricity Internet care when it's needed for various things universal health care obviously access to basic health care universal education, etc. And we must undo all the existing systems of inequality. Obviously, we have to decarcerate our, our mass incarceration system is one of the most egregious uh, uh, stains on this country. Um, period. Um, we have to decriminalize, uh, depolicing, land back, uh, working uh, on a whole host of issues regarding decolonization. Uh, reparations, uh, obviously, can get into uh, explanations about why that should be obvious to anyone. Uh, ending corporate control of all sorts of things, not just politics, ending money in politics. Obviously, we need more permeable borders. That's a whole another set of uh, concerns. And the point is this, so this is the real kicker. Until one, two, and three are met, practitioners who are doing their very best, healthcare systems that are doing their very best, there will never be complete justice. And it will be almost impossible to provide truly equitable care until the conditions for the possibility of a just society are brought about. Healthcare cannot be just, and we cannot root out all of the ableism in it at whatever level. Uh, if the society in which healthcare practitioners are working, if that society is fundamentally unjust, you cannot fix it simply at, at this source. So even though I move quickly, I hope that you can see that even though I do think there are some changes that definitely should occur and can occur at the level of medical education, at the level of individual practitioners, how they think, how they communicate, uh, all of this stuff, there has to be a systems level approach. And that is what I think disability justice uh, a disability justice framework teaches us about COVID-19. The failure we have experienced and continue to experience is primarily a result from an existing, highly unequal, unjust society. And we must try to make things more just. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds, for that uh, very rich talk. There's a lot to talk about here with this. And um, I want to remind our participants uh, that to submit questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we're going to get to those questions in Q&A very soon here. But first, we have a couple of guests to lead us off to ask Dr. Reynolds uh, a couple of initial questions. So first, our first question is going to come from Dr. Andrea Yanez, who is a family medicine physician and the physician champion for equity, inclusion, and diversity for Kaiser Permanente Kern County. Dr. Yanez. Thank you, Dr. Olson. And thank you, Dr. Reynolds, for that um, great discussion about uh, disability uh, justice. And I think it brings up a lot of questions Currently, you mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic and what physicians and providers are really facing is this shift in medical care to the virtual space, both uh, telephone visits and video visits. And I'm wondering if you can either kind of let us know based on your personal experiences or your research and what you've been hearing over the past you know, almost two years now, how um, is that virtual space in healthcare impacting patients or people with disabilities? And what advice might you offer to physicians or practicing providers in terms of helping make that care more equitable? That's a fantastic question. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that one of the, the biggest kind of lessons to come out of the engagement that disabled people have had with the healthcare system over the last few years is trying to um, from the get go, think about patients as as partners uh, in care in many different respects, and not just in kind of a metaphorical sense, but in a literal sense. And I have, you know, heard just anecdotally from some people where the shift to a more virtual environment has been fantastic. Like, uh, I mean, even in uh, with respect to my family's life, like it's really hard for my mom to physically get to appointments and being able to have virtual spaces and do virtual appointments has been a, a boon. But of course, for some, uh, it's been really insufficient. 
um, uh, sign language interpretation hasn't necessarily been provided when it's needed. Captioning hasn't been provided when it's needed. Maybe someone who has various sorts of light sensitivity um, and does want to do a virtual thing, but maybe they can't do Zoom and they need to do phone, but then that becomes too complicated. You know, there's accessibility, um, as, as many activists will say, accessibility, there is no one size fit all, fits all way to think about this. And it does uh, place a, um, a responsibility on, I think, the individual practitioner, whatever domain they're in, to try to the extent that they can to individualize um, whatever, it, whatever it might be. Things are not going to work uh, equally well the same way for everybody. Um, so the, the short answer is, is, in some ways it's been great, and in some ways it's introduced new problems. And I think that as long as um, there's continued communication and engagement on how to uh, resolve issues as they arise and how to make things more accessible, in some ways, this has been a benefit, uh, at least the virtual, now that everyone's used to Zoom, I think that's definitely a good thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yunez. Uh, next, we have a question from Chidima Oke DK who is one of our Kegley Institute of Ethics student fellows this year. Shadima? Hi, Dr. Reynolds. I'd just like to first say thank you for such an inspiration talk, inspirational conversation. I really learned a lot. And I will go ahead and ask my question. <laughs> um, as a student who would like to be a disability activist and combat ableism within my school and amongst my peers, how and where would I start that journey? That is a fantastic question. Um, there's a few answers to that, but I'll, I'll just say that one of the benefits of living in the internet age is there's now a really rich set of not simply resources online, but communities online that talk together through listservs um, or through Facebook pages or whatever. You know, if you look to places like the National Council on Disability, which has amazing resources on everything from, you know, some of the stuff I talked about today, like debates about quality of life and the role in medicine, to how organizations can be accessible in their labor practices, to how schools should be thinking more capaciously about IEPs, like you name it, there's um, resources like the National Council on Disability. There's activist organizations that you can directly link into like ADAPT um, and ASAN. There are also groups, um, the one I, that just popped into my head is more scholarly, but the Society for Disability Studies has this listserv. Um, I've been on that for years and, and people love just helping each other like, hey, here's the situ here's what I'm trying to do in this space. You know, can you give me, can you point me to some resources um, who should I talk to if I think I need to actually file an ADA complaint to get something through? Like all of that stuff um, is available. And so the short answer is I would get hooked into existing disability activist communities, whether in whether where you live or through the internet, you know, kind of across the globe, and you'll just find an amazing uh, wealth of uh, resources and people who are eager eager to fight fight that battle <laughs> together with you with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds. Thank you, Chidima. Um, okay, so we're gonna now do some questions from the Q&A. So there's still time to put uh, some questions in there. Um, I see we've got a few questions here. Um, first, um, Dr. Reynolds, we're gonna start with a question from Nadia Salem. Uh, she has a question about how you, what you feel or how do you feel about subminimum wage for because a person is disabled? Yeah, the short answer is that should be illegal. Um, there should not be subminimum wages, period, end of story. <laughs> um, the, the longer answer would require some conversation about how that actually became a, a, a thing, you know, in the first place, um, which is a very terrifying story that goes back to the history of eugenics and institutionalization uh, institutes, especially in the, the early, all the way up through even like the 1980s, think of Willowbrook, were in some senses labor camps. And the fact that, um, uh, and I've, it's, you know, this is like something you can Google. So um, the fact that industries like Goodwill take advantage of laws that have been established 
uh, in the wake of this way of thinking of disabled people's labor as less valuable, even if they're doing the exact same thing that an able-bodied person would do, and even if their labor is necessary, I just find this completely indefensible. Um, so yeah, that has to stop. No more subminimum wages, period. Okay, uh, next question. This is also a policy kind of question. This comes from Britt McDill, uh, who asks, how do you see the ADA helping or hindering disability justice? That is a great question. And um, I'm gonna point you to a book because nothing I say will be as eloquent as, as what I'm gonna point you to. There's a book by Marta, M-A-R-T-A Russell, R-U-S-S-E-L-L. -S it's called Beyond Ramps. Um, and if you look up uh, Russell's work, you'll also see that there was a later edited volume uh, that I can't remember who the editor was, but they took a bunch of Russell's writings across various spaces and compiled it. So that's that would be like the second thing to read. And Russell was a disability activist who in some senses like was fighting for the ADA and at the same time was highly critical of it. On the one hand, wanted to say, this is great that we have it. This has provided a lever to change things in the world for the better. But it also, Russell argues, took the wind out of the sails of some of the most intense disability activists organizing. And the fact that we have an anti-discrimination law instead of a constitutional approach to disability, that is just a huge failure. That's a failure that has to be rectified. The ADA is not in place of an amendment that would make sure people are not discriminated against on the basis of disability. It's just not, not replaceable. Um, or, you, I just gave the discrimination language, but re reframe that for how it would appear if it was an amendment, you know what I'm saying. Um, so I take a look at those two sources. Um, I'd also pay attention to uh, journals, um, which are often written for a wider public audience, you know, this doesn't uh, require someone to have a PhD in a specialized area. Journals like the Society for Disability Studies, uh, there's the Journal of Disability Policy, uh, the journal Disability and Society, at least two of those three are open access. Um, and they have, if you just Google ADA kind of critique, you'll find some very interesting analyses, whether they're coming from sociologists, activist spaces, anthropologists, philosophers, you name it. Okay, this next question comes from Deborah Jackson, uh, says, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm a fan of your work and learn so much from you. Um, she says, I'm a parent of a child who could be characterized as neurodivergent, and I struggle with understanding that difference as a disability versus as an impairment. I'm wondering what you think of the use of medication to treat um, neurodivergence with scare quotes around treat. Um, does that buy into a way of that view of difference as a flaw that needs correction, um, or is there a way to understand it as a medical protest? Um, that facilitates access in a world uh, designed for people who are neurotypical. Sorry, it's kind of a lot, she has a lot in that question there. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, a really great question. Th this, I think, is very hard to answer in a, in a straightforward way because A, it's often highly individualized. I don't think we can just, I think it's irresponsible to just make claims you know, for example, let's 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 restrict ourselves to talking about um, autistic people to just make claims about what is right or wrong at that level of generalization or what should or should not be done, I think is is a should not be done. <laughs> um, having said that, one of the things that you know I have learned from like the organization ASAN that I've learned from scholars and activists like Lydia X Z Brown uh, is that. The starting point for these sorts of questions, the starting point has to be in the testimony and the evidence and what people with these conditions actually say. So in the case of the question you asked, um, hold on, I'm just pulling back up the, the wording, you know, I would be very interested to, to not simply hear about what how your child thinks about these things, but also what do other people um, in similar ages or, or wider age ranges who identify similarly, who are facing similar sorts of differences and, and maybe modifications at the level of how their education goes or maybe interventions that are, that are, are medicalized or not, um, I would want to go to them to find the answer. Um, 
to the specific question of the medication to treat neurodivergence. Yeah, this gets tricky because there's a little bit of a cart horse being put before the cart, cart before the horse. Um, treatment is a loaded word, right? Um, you know, it, 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 it's, you know, I know people who have, uh, uh, let's so I have, I have depression, I have generalized anxiety disorder and some other stuff. Like I need medication, <laughs> like I need meds uh, to address what is on some level an underlying biochemical uh, uh, issue in my case to talk about when I talk about depression and when I talk about anxiety and I reflect upon the ways in which those things have modified and, and shaped my identity and my person, it feels a little weird to say that I'm treating my depression and anxiety in that sense. On the other hand, of course I'm treating it in the sense that these, the, in my case, the medications are very, very helpful for me. Um, and I want that sort of narrow biomedical intervention. I, I really want that. While I want us to not overly pathologize anyone who has depression or it used to be called schizothemia or like, you know, you, you go through the history of medicine and the way we overly medicalize things. I mean, ADHD is probably the most obvious example here is itself a problem. So I think we need a really, this is all to say, I think we need a very nuanced a uh, very complex set of discussions and understandings around this. And I'll give a shout out to the work of Eric Perrins. Um, he has, um, I think his, the, the book I'm thinking of is called Shaping Humans. Hold on, let me just Google this to check. Ah, Shaping Ourselves, uh, colon, on technology flourishing and a habit of thought. And one of the reasons I really like this work, he does really intense downstream uh, uh, research on these sorts of issues and many others, is he says, look, we have to have a binocular viewpoint on these things. We need to both hold on to some sorts of medical models and, and medical ways of knowing about things and social models and more critical models. And we need to be able to shift between these viewpoints to give us depth. Without the depth of shifting between the viewpoints and understanding how they do or do not apply in various ways, we're actually not going to be seeing the phenomenon at the level of complexity that it actually exists in the world. Sorry, that my answer was way too long. My apologies. No, I think that was a great answer here. So we're starting to get to the end of our time here. I'm going to combine a couple of questions into in one question here. So we have uh, a couple of questions about medical education and thinking about uh, medical education. So from uh, Tiffany, she mentions that from the very start of medical education, uh, we as physicians are taught explicitly and implicitly to just keep working through illness and disability. Uh, her question is, what sort of changes can we make to medical education and culture to improve the acceptance of disability within our uh, community? And then a different question from Tiffany Sansoulis is asking, have you made strides and changes in medical education? Have disability study scholars, have you started to see how medical education is changing because of work that like what you're doing? That's, um, both of those are such great questions. Thank you. Yeah, I, so I have many friends who are, are medical practitioners of various sorts, whether, you know, neurosurgeons, uh, RNs, GPs, you name it. And I'm just, it is terrifying to me what they are put through uh in, in med school and the demands that are placed on their bodies and minds and the the sis you know i i don't have the answers for how to reform <laughs> i'm the wrong person to ask on how to reform medical education but it seems to me that actually the very structure of medical education and the demands it places on people is a perfect example of an ableism that here is negatively impacting people who might actually think of themselves as completely able-bodied um, and the mental health effects and the physical effects that this sort of stuff has is problematic. And as you pointed out, because it, the system is structured that way, it also keeps excluding disabled people who might come into the profession and be physicians or be RNs or be surgeons or what or radiologists or whatever it might be. It's excluding them from the get go. They don't even necessarily get into the process. Um, 
So I don't have the answer. I don't know. Give more time. Give more, like I have no idea at a structural level how to change it. I mean, PhDs are bad enough. I barely made it through mine. Um, but it has to change. I feel like it. It just it has to change. The demands placed on on medical practitioners, especially at the tr through the training, is just too much. I just think it's it's just too much. Um, regarding the second question. Um, Sorry, the second one was about, um, have you started to see changes oh. already given your work that you're doing with disability studies? Yes, so on the one hand, there's way more that needs to be done, you know, as those vignettes exemplified. Um, on the other hand, let me, let me point out two really promising things. One, right at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, Right when some of the headlines were coming out and some of these amazing reporters like Jeff, Joseph Shapiro, David Perry, and these others who are on the disability beat for big national um, uh, journalistic outlets were reporting about discriminatory uh, crisis standards of care policies. I mean, there is a huge, you know, you started seeing pieces in the New England Journal of Medicine, in the Lancet, in the Hastings Center report being like, hey, stop it you know like here's how these things have to go if you're not going to be discriminatory um not just discriminatory in an ethical level but also not breaking the law and there was a fusion in many cases of biomedical ethicists who are not themselves part of disability communities or disability activism and disability activists you know making these arguments almost together sharing each other's works getting their uh, the evidence that they were presenting for these things, you know, on hospital review boards, inside of, you know, all sorts of things. And even the UN, the, the UN, by April, they already had a guidance statement out relative to the United Nations conventions on the right with people with disabilities, persons with disabilities, saying, hey, 180 signatory nation states, of course, the US hasn't signed on because yeah, that's another story. Um, hey, you need to be thinking about this stuff with the pandemic to make sure you're respecting the rights of people with disabilities. All of that was extremely encouraging. It's also encouraging, uh, I wouldn't normally plug something I'm a part of, but in this case, it's appropriate. I had the great joy of co-editing um, what's called the Disability Bioethics Reader with Christine Wiesler. That is coming out with Rutledge in May or June at the latest. It's a 37 chapter book that can be used in medical education, uh, uh, college, university education, continuing medical education credits that goes through some uh, a number of core bioethical issues and just biomedical issues, issues that uh, many of the chapters are just stuff that clinicians will face and does it through the lens of research and critical disability studies, through the lens of research and philosophy of disability and as rooted fundamentally in the experiences and and uh, and work by by disabled people and disability activists, and just the fact that we got the book contract, that it's coming out, that it'll be out in the world, um, and you'll see it's just an amazing lineup of scholars. You know that really makes me happy, and we'll see if a lot of people start using it, and if it you know takes off. There's at least a reader now, <laughs> so that that's better than there not being one. Um, so yeah, there's, those are two bright spots in an otherwise very, very harrowing uh, uh, set of unjust and equitable situations societally, more generally. Thank you. Um, so there's, we have a lot of great questions here in the q and I, I think we've got time to do one more of these questions uh, tonight. So um, one question here from Grace uh, Nags. I apologize if I'm not getting pronunciation of your last name correct here. Uh, her question is about um, government officials. What can or should government officials do to bring more awareness to disability rights and ethics, especially in the pandemic? What should young voters or activists do um, also to make this more a, talk, a more talked about issue? That is also a great question. And uh... I realize because of time we're not going to get to everybody's questions, so I just want to share my screen one more time and say um, I'd be super happy if you want to shoot me um, an email and I'm happy to talk further about any of this stuff i'm super happy to send you links to resources all the amazing stuff out there from disability activists and, and disability say scholars so that's visible right you got my email on there and. There's my Twitter too, just because I guess you it's obligatory to put that up these days. Um, 
So what can we do? Um, here, let me read this again. One of the most important things uh, is, is getting disabled people in the room, putting them on the hospital review boards, having disabled people at the table in the policy, wherever the policy space is, whether it's in the White House, whether it's your local community, uh, whatever they're called, the, you know, at all levels, there needs to be people um, who actually have these experiences at the table and knowledge. And of course, if for some reason that's just not possible, then at minimum, you need people who have uh, training and understanding in disability studies, disability activist work, and this sort of stuff. So one of the biggest things is, uh, even though it sounds like a cliche at this point, but inclusion in the literal sense of getting better representation of disabled people at these various levels of decision making. Um, in terms of uh, what should young voters um, and activists do, I mean, far as I can tell, things are th there's a lot going on. You know, there's a lot of really exciting work. Um, I think I would go back to the work of people like Talila A. Lewis, Dustin J. Gibson, uh, Leah Lakshmi, um, uh, Peep, Peep Nazara. Um, I forgot the name of the other person. Uh, there are uh, disability activists who are doing the on the ground community engagement and community organization who are trying to put together and enact frameworks that think about disability justice alongside at the same time as and inextricable from racial justice, gender justice, justice for indigenous people. Um, you, you name all of this stuff and they're thinking in a, in a very capacious sort of framework. And this, I think, is the most exciting thing politically. I mean, you saw tidbits of this. If you remember Bernie Sanders run uh, 20, 20 run for the 2016 presidency, you saw tidbits of this with some of his more universal policies where he's just trying to be like, yeah, we have to have a base floor. Um, Without the base floor, we will never, <laughs> we will never get anywhere close to even pretending we're a just society. Um, and some of that stuff, even though when you couch it in universal terms, it doesn't seem intersectional. I think that actually the logic behind some of that was very much a disability justice logic. You know, you cannot let people be homeless in a just society. It's also just cheaper. It's literally cheaper if we just make sure no one is on the street. Um, and that in and of it, when you look at the relationship between people being unhoused and then the relationship between th those people and our mental health care crisis and how many people end up on the streets who actually just have uh, uh, are underserved relative mental health, then you look at the amount that end up in our prison and jail system, where on conservative estimates, over 50% of people in our mass incarceration system have a disability of some sort. And you know that the 13th Amendment has a loophole that allows them to work for free and it's just a new form of slavery. And you know that we have the largest mass incarceration per capita of any country on earth. And we have things way backwards. <laughs> like, um, And these systems have to be rooted out, uh, that they have to be undone and rethought. Um, and so I hope, you know, I do have hope when I see some of the younger uh, voters and activists who are just like, no, none of the stuff y'all have been talking about is radical enough. This is not enough. Also, climate change. We're past, we're on the precipice. Like, we've got, like, the clock is ticking or all hell is going to continue breaking loose at levels that are going to just utterly destroy life for a significant, especially people in the global south, who it's going to impact more so people who are low economic status. It will impact disproportionately. Uh, I digress. I really got on the soapbox there at the end. Uh, so yeah, we need to fix everything, and I hope that uh, I hope that people with more energy than me uh, can figure out how the hell to do that. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Thank you. I, I don't know how there's if there are more people or people with more energy than you. So <laughs> it's you know I get my energy from my dog Schnurk. You know he he really <laughs> he just emits energy and I get to soak it up. So. Well, that's great. Um, so I want to remind the people, the attendees, to complete the evaluation that we have in the chat here. Uh, you can see, uh, and uh, that gives us 
feedback both on this session, but also it's a chance for you to give us ideas for future or your ideas, you know, what you'd like to see in future sessions here too. Um, I want to close too with that. There's a, a comment here I want to read to you, Dr. Reynolds. Um, this is from the president of our university, Liz Lynette Selesny, um, who says in the comments here, uh, powerful and brilliant lecture, Professor Reynolds, thank you for sharing your thought-provoking scholarship with Cal State Bakersfield. Your wisdom strengthens us as a compassionate university and challenges us as an institution that values equity and social justice. Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you so much. It was a real thank pleasure you. to be here. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks for everyone tuning in or watching later. Uh, I really appreciated the, the rich responses and, and this opportunity. I'm sad I couldn't be there in the sunny West Coast. I guess it's sunny here too, but anyway, I hope you all are okay out there. Thank you. It is it is sunny. We've had some, it's been smoky, but it is sunny at the at the time. Or it's sunny. Well, now sundown, but uh, it's been sunny. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And yeah, thank you, Dr. Reynolds, for this wonderful talk this evening. And we look forward to seeing you all at a future Kegley Institute of Ethics event.